We're going to start with the land acknowledgement. We at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay acknowledge the First Nations people who are the original inhabitants of the region. The Ho-Chunk Nation and the Menominee Nation are the original First People of Wisconsin, and both nations have ancient historical and spiritual connections to the land that our institution now resides upon. Today, Wisconsin is home to 12 First Nation communities, including the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, Forest County Potawatomi, Ojibwe Nation communities, Stockbridge Muncie Community Band of Mohicans, uh, Mohican Indians, and the Brothertown Indian Nation. We acknowledge the First Nations people of Wisconsin. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm Ryan Martin. I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and it is uh, here at UW-Green Bay, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today and also just thank her for the incredible work she's done so far uh, with, with our conference. Um, our speaker today is the Assistant Library Director for Research and Outreach Services at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Uh, she has a master's degree in library and information sciences from UW Milwaukee from 2002, and she oversees uh, and is an active participant in the UW Green Bay Library Information Literacy Program. Uh, she helps shape policy and procedures for research and outreach services, the library website, and various patron services. Her professional interests include librarianship, or critical librarianship, digital literacy, and information ethics. She has also been the co-planner of this year's Common Cause Conference, and I'm so very, very, very thankful for her work on this year's conference. Please, please, please welcome and put your virtual hands together uh, for our speaker today, Renee Ettinger, her, uh, and her talk, Building Your Post-Truth Toolbox. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Ryan. That was lovely. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to be even happier when I share my screen. People are going to tell me that I'm doing that correctly. Let's see. Okay. Now I'm going to rely on Amanda to tell me whether or not everyone can see my um, building your post truth toolbox PowerPoint. I'm guessing it's there unless I hear otherwise. Thank you. Okay, thanks again for coming to um, our discussion here today about information literacy, news and media literacy, why that's important, and why we really should be teaching it in the classroom. What I want to do, oh goodness, here we go. Okay, I want to give you a little roadmap for today. So first, I would like to review the current research on the state of students' digital and information literacy skills. One of the things I wanted to do today was to make sure that um, we know why it's important that we infuse digital and news literacy into our classrooms. And then we're going to take some time to look at the um, UW-Green Bay Library's Teaching Media and News Literacy Curriculum Resource Guide. So I'm going to spotlight a few resources that should help you um, teach these things in the classroom. Okay, so let's get started talking about the research. I mean, essentially I'm a research librarian, so I love to do research. Um, when I was looking at the current research on the state of students' digital and information literacy skills, um, wow, it, it probably wasn't um, fantastic. Uh, one thing that did stand out to me is the number of different disciplines that are looking at digital and news literacy and information literacy, specifically like our current kind of misinformation problems that we're having. So you would expect disciplines like, you know, journalism, communication, probably education to be looking at librarianship, certainly to be looking at this issue. But I found research from so many different subject areas, um, environmental science, um, in medical journals, in sociology journals, political science. Um, it's just kind of all over the place. And it really made, um, it kind of hit home for me that this, this touches all aspects of, of our society and life. So here are some common things that they're finding. One is that students at pretty much all grade levels are struggling with determining authority. And by that, I mean 
they're not doing a fantastic job of looking at a piece of content or a piece of research and saying, who made this and why? And also like, are they actually qualified to be putting this information out into the world? Students are, are, not, are not doing a fantastic job with that. Um, also, they are failing to recognize point of view or intent to influence. And they're not really understanding the origin of online content. So we know that like content is born in one place and it can go through so many different channels before it gets in front of someone's eyes. So they are not understanding that if they see something on TikTok, you know, the, the point of origin could be really far removed. I wanna look at one specific study just briefly from the Stanford, His Stanford History Education Group. So the Stanford History Education Group, oh, let's see, sorry about that, wanted to look at my chat. <laughs> um, okay, they are a fantastic group of folks from Stanford University that do excellent research in the area of um, information literacy. They also do a lot of field work and in that area, and they, um, they uh, develop curriculum too. We're actually gonna look at some of their curriculum a little bit later on in the session. Uh, we are going to look at this specific study, the Evaluating Information, the Cornerstone of Civic and Online Reasoning. This is one of their more well-known studies. And it measured fairly basic um, digital literacy skills at three different levels. So middle school, high school, and college. And I do just want to note that um, it came from a very broad range um, demographic and socioeconomic um, schools. So really a lot of different kids were tested in this particular um, study. Okay, let's start with the middle schoolers. So um, the middle schoolers were given five tasks to complete, um, including article and social media analysis, understanding online comments section, um, and some news searching. Uh, a highlight, and I don't know if we call this a highlight, maybe a low light, is that over 80% of them did not recognize um, sponsored content as being advertising. Like they just didn't get that if something, if it was a sponsored post on social media or a sponsored article on a website, they did not recognize that that, that thing was paid to be there. It's paid placement. So this goes back to that kind of um, idea that students are not great at understanding point of view or intent to influence. The high schoolers, um, they were also given, I think, five or six tasks. Um, a lot of it was comparing reporting or looking at um, evidence, comparing evidence from two different websites. But in one of their tasks, they were given a photo and almost a, a post, a social media post actually with a photo in it. And over half of them, um, they just accepted the photograph as sufficient evidence for a claim. So they didn't bother to figure out if that photo was real. Um, there was an actual link you could click on the photo and it would take you to where it originally came from. They, over half of them did not bother to dig deeper for that authority of the photo. They just thought, hey, it's a photo, it must be true, which is a, a little terrifying in this day of sophisticated photo editors and deep fake videos. Moving on to the college students. The tasks for college students were a little more complex. They required some deeper analysis. Um, for one task, over half of the college students, um, they weren't able to articulate why um, statistics collected by a um, political organization might contain bias. This is again, almost like the photo. They saw it, it's a statistic, statistics are pure facts, it must be true. Even though, again, the statistic itself, how it was presented to the students, they could have clicked right on it and dug deeper for authority. Almost half of them did not do that. 
and they weren't able to tell us like, hmm, maybe a political organization with a very strong point of view may be able to manipulate stats or present stats in a certain way to their advantage. So that is a little bit of a highlight of the research. This is just like a little quotation that I found when I was researching and I thought it was very um, appropriate for the state of news and media literacy today. I won't read it, I'm not a big slide reader, but to me, all those three tasks have something in common that um, students at all levels are having a hard time analyzing for context. So they're not really looking at why something, a piece of content was put out into the world, who put it out there, they are really accepting that I see it. I, I see it on a site that maybe you trust, maybe you don't trust, and they're not digging deeper. So we need to figure out how to get our students to dig deeper and look at the content that they are seeing, especially online, and um, analyze that for authority and for quality and for bias. So approaches differ, but as I was looking at uh, the research, there were a few things that were common. So um, something that a lot of the studies that I looked at said that we should be talking to our students about the concept of cognitive biases, um, specifically confirmation bias, which um, those of you who um, may not be familiar with that, confirmation bias is really, it's our um, tendency to seek out information that we agree with, right? Like we don't really want to be challenged. Like that's that we want people to agree with us. We want to get along with everyone. So we want to read things and hear about things that already reinforce what we believe which of course can be a problem when it comes to misinformation, right? So if we believe something that isn't true, we're not actively seeking out a different opinion. We're just kind of seeking out the things that already say, yeah, I agree with that too, even though it may or may not be evidence-based or fact-based. So one thing we wanna do in our classrooms is to start looking for lessons that in an appropriate way um, help our students understand that there are these things called cognitive biases and we all have them and they influence how we um, react to online content, how we react to media, how we react to news. The other thing that uh, most researchers agree, the folks who are doing research in news and media literacy agree, is that we should start teaching our students how to evaluate online content as fact checkers. So I'm gonna show you one site in just a little bit that really goes in depth in this and in how to um, teach students how to look at online content as a fact checker. And uh, for the most part, once you learn this technique, it is um, a pretty fast thing to do. It just kind of becomes second nature. Okay. So um, now that we have a little bit of an idea of what the research is saying, um, I just wanted to pop this slide up here um, from DPI, uh, the well, Wisconsin Standards for Information and Technology Literacy. Um, it has an aim for all Wisconsin students to be able to access, evaluate, and use information and technology to engage in and take ownership of their learning. And I wanted to put this out here because when I think of access, evaluate, and use information, that's, that's just research. It's accessing information, evaluating it, using it. That is research skills, whether that is traditional, I am going to look in this book for some information, or I'm out there just Googling in the wilderness, looking for um, evidence, looking for things that back up my opinion, looking for hopefully things that challenge my opinion and make me grow as a person. Um, and I think that we probably, most of us are doing a decent job at teaching people how to access and use information. So here is some research, here is how you maybe incorporate it into a paper, here's how you incorporate it into a project. But where we might be falling down a little bit, um, at least what the research tells us, is we may be falling down in the evaluate part. So 
looking at our curriculum resource guide. I am hopefully going to show you some sites today that have great lessons and great advice for infusing your existing assignments, which is kind of the easiest way to do it. Look at the assignments you already have and infuse news and media literacy into it, but giving you some tools to help your students become better evaluators of content, not just, hey, I can find it and here's maybe how I cite it in a paper or here's how I can get it into a project. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to the teaching media and news literacy curriculum resource guide that we developed here at the UWGB libraries. I am telling you, I've been a librarian for a long time, um, 15 plus years, and I've seen lots of resource lists. And sometimes they are just, boy, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of links that are, some of them are questionably useful. So I am telling you this list that we have created is it's highly curated. It really is just the best sites that we could find. It's not a, a garbage dump of every single person that's doing anything remotely related to media and news literacy. It's, it's the best stuff that we could find out there. So, all right, let's jump into that guide. I'm going to get out of my PowerPoint here and hopefully everyone will still be able to see my screen. Right now I am on the teaching media and news literacy guide. So I'm hoping we still see that. I'm again, going to trust that someone will tell me they can't if they can't. Okay. I have four different sections in this guide. So the first section is, um, I'm calling it lessons and activities, and that are individual lessons and activities that really are um, best suited for you to look at current assignments that you already have and say, hey, how can I infuse this assignment I already give my students with some more evaluation techniques? So for the research portion, let's see. Oh, seeing the PowerPoint, but not the LibGuides. Is that true for everyone else? Okay. Let me maybe reshare. Any better? Fantastic. All right. Good, good. Okay, so here we are in the teaching, what, we'll back up a little bit. Here we are in the teaching media and news literacy guide. Thank you all. Um, I have it broken up into four different areas, lessons and activities, units and full courses, professional development, and then some research. Um, for lesson, lessons and activities, this is for you to infuse it into lessons you already have. So you have a research assignment, like really at, make sure that you are um, having your students evaluate those sources, not just finding them and putting them into the paper, putting them into the project, like they like deliberately have them show you how, why they think this is a good source. Um, the other section I have here, units and full courses, it's almost the same thing. So it still talks about lessons in um, evaluating content, digital and news um, literacy um, lessons and activities and assessments, but they're bundled together in a way where if you have enough time to devote in your class to make it kind of like a mini unit, that please, I, that would be, that's ideal but I know that we don't live in an ideal world and we have a lot of things competing for our classroom time. So we can't always say, hey, yeah, I'm gonna spend five class periods on this, or I'm gonna do a couple of weeks and completely revamp my news and, and media literacy. But if you have that luxury, if you're really like, yes, I'm gonna go all in on news and media literacy, these units and full courses are really where you want to be. Um, professional development, I'm just going to spotlight a couple of things there in a few minutes. Um, this is for us to make sure that our skills for um, teaching news and media, media literacy are staying fresh. 
And then I just have some research. And this certainly isn't all the research that I found, but there's a lot of research. I have a whole bibliography that I can share with you. But, you know, sometimes we have to make a case with our colleagues or with um, maybe administrators to say, like, I'm, I'm going to change my classroom stuff a little bit. I'm going to punch up my curriculum with some more news and media literacy. And having that research at your back can, can sometimes be helpful. Okay, I'm going to pop back up here to lessons and activities, just give you a little brief rundown. Um, if it has a little picture of a video, it means there's videos. If it has a little pencil, it means you can customize it. And if it has the check mark, it includes some assessments. So some quizzing or some other assessment where you can, um, you know, do some knowledge checks of how things went with your lesson. I'm going to start in the digital citizenship curriculum. Okay, can everyone still see this? Awesome, thank you, Chris. Okay, so the digital citizenship curriculum, this was put out by our friends at Common Sense Media Education. Uh, they are an advocacy group, um, and they really are focused on teaching children how to um, safely navigate the internet and um, they lobby for a lot of um, um, information privilege type, type of things like expanding broadband and they look at a lot of digital divide issues. So these are some fantastic folks doing things out there. I like the digital citizenship curriculum because it's one of the only curriculums out there that really spans like K through 12. Um, a lot of news and info, um, our news and media literacy things start around middle school, not so much in the grade school level. So it's one of the reasons why I decided to spot like this, because you can um, do this for the younger grades as well. Um, a lot of the resources will require a free account. So you do have to make yourself a free account, a free account for the um, digital citizenship curriculum but that's easy enough to do. Um, let me check my chat one more time. Okay, good. <laughs> um, it's um, kind of sectioned up into these di six different sections that all have to do um, with safely navigating the internet. Um, I'm going to look at this one, the news and media literacy. So that just kind of sorts it. It gives you a lesson for every single grade. If I pop into, I'm gonna do this fifth grade one reading news online. One of the things I love about this is that it gives you your learning objectives. It um, links them to common core standards. Um, very often it'll give you a quick lesson if you don't have time for the full activity, but for the full activity, it gives you everything you need. So it'll give you your SLEER um, slide deck, if there's a video, if there's quizzes, if there's an assessment. This one even has a take home activity, which is pretty cool. So especially if you are an educator for um, younger, the younger grades, looking at this um, common sense education, um, digital citizenship curriculum is a fantastic resource. And again, I'm gonna go through some of these kind of quickly because I do wanna show you three or four more things and I would love to have time for questions at the end. Uh, the next thing I wanna pop, in, pop into is this SIFT, the four moves website. This is from Mike Caulfield. Mike Caulfield, this is the resource I said I was going to show you that has to do with teaching your students how to evaluate online content as fact checkers. So um, this, let's pop out here. What I actually have linked is an article, a blog post from Mike Caulfield that really pulls apart this SIFT method. So this is a quick, easy method that you can start teaching in middle school, but like we also teach this at the college level and our students are like, yes, I've never heard of this before and this is super useful. So it's it really, you can start this fairly early, but it's not too, you know, it you can definitely college students get a lot from this method. So it's looking at an online source or a piece of content, you stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, and then trace your claims. So again, it's looking at the authority of a piece of content, not just accepting it on its face that it's true or useful or helpful. You're digging into 
who created this thing and why. If I go all the way down to the bottom, after Mike is done explaining his SIFT method, he does link out to this three hour online mini course, which actually works pretty well for um, an out of class course. It's, it's pretty packaged. So especially if you're maybe at the high school or college level and you want to throw some points on some at home homework, this, this works really well. And these are all um, completely customizable. So these would be considered um, open educational resources. So they're, um, they're under, they're created under a Creative Commons license, which means that you can remix, reuse them. If you don't like the examples he's using and you want to use different sites for your students to investigate, maybe something that's more applicable to your content area, you can sub in different sites. It's a very nice customizable resource to do that thing that most of the research is telling us to do with our students now, and that is to teach them how to evaluate online content as fact checkers. That is one of the big things that we really need to start infusing into our teaching. Again, it's that we're missing the evaluation part. We can get them to find it and use it, but we're skipping that middle part, evaluating. Okay. I don't know if any of you use the TED Ed videos. Um, I have the media and journalism collection here linked. I like the TED Ed videos because you um, can take a TED animation or other videos and lay some questions over them. Uh, so like uh, kind of knowledge check questions, you can do discussion posts. Let me show you an example here. Now, this is just the big bucket O oh, media and journalism TED Ed videos. So it's not all going to be strictly teaching news and you know information literacy, but you can definitely find um, news and information literacy TED Ed videos in here, like this one, how to spot a misleading graph. Our high school students just accepted stats as stats. It must be a fact. It's a stat. We couldn't possibly mislead with statistics, could we? Oh, yeah, we really can, guys. So if we click on this, we have the, my goodness, we have the video, but then with our think, yeah. So there's lots of good questions. So here I have eight different questions that have been created about this video. I have a discussion post that's been created about this video. And the neat thing about that is if you make yourself a free account on TED Ed, you can customize these questions. You can get rid of some, you can make your own. They give you your own unique link to send to your students and then you can track their progress. So if you want to make sure that, again, you can give this as homework or as independent learning time in class, they can watch the video, answer the questions, and it all goes to your TED Ed account so you know that they've actually done it. The neat thing about that is you can create your own. So if we go to create up here and go to a lesson, say we wanna do something on those, cognitive biases, which we're supposed to be looking at. Here, they give us some videos on cognitive biases. If I click on any one of those and hit continue, I can make my own questions. I can go ahead and um, give, make questions, make discussion posts, get my individual link from, the TED, from my TED Ed account, send that to my students. So this is a really cool resource for those of you who have never used the TED Ed videos. Okay, so I encourage you to kind of look through um, this whole list here of the lessons and activities. I have my units and full courses. The civic online reasoning I used, um, I did put a recommended star on that. That's from our friends at the Stanford History Education Group. This is like their curriculum branch. That's very cool. Some of these do stand on their own, but they do have full units as well. Um, this is another resource that requires a sign-in. So that's also a free sign-in. So there's lots of like create an account, but for the most part, those are, I mean, actually, I don't think I gave you anything that wouldn't be a free account. 
Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to skip down to professional development. Uh, this KQED Teach Media Academy for Educators, there is, a Wisconsin, there is a Wisconsin cohort of this. It's free. You can take the classes on your own, but if you follow this link, the pbswisconsineducation.org media literacy, um, you can apply to become part of the Wisconsin cohort and go through that with other Wisconsin educators, or you can go ahead and do that on your own. And then the other thing I've spotlighted as a recommended resource under um, professional development is the SIFT newsletter, and that's the News Literacy Project's weekly newsletter, which if you really start talking a lot about digital literacy in your classroom, um, they will give you recommended sites to talk about for every single week. Like, hey, here's some here's a viral rumor that's going around this week, or here's some reporting that you can compare. So it's, uh, it's again, that's just an email to go ahead and um, sign up for that SIFT newsletter. Okay. All right. Oh my goodness. I only left us three minutes for questions. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything, any comments, questions. Um, I, I'd love to take our last three minutes together and um, answer anything that I very quickly went over in our 35 minutes that just flew by. I see Ryan took himself off mute, but I can't hear him. That was just to say thank you. And also just to let people know, um, you can throw stuff in the chat or in the Q&A if you've got questions. Okay. You're welcome, David. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, David. Well, take some time to, oh, hey. That's great, okay, thank you, Chris. And I think we'll be sharing this on Common Cause website, right? And yep. um, it's, yeah. It... What I will do is um, I will chase some of these resources, uh, chase, um, send an email out to people with some of the resources you talked about, links, things like that. So you can expect an email from me with some additional information. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to hang out with us today. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. And don't forget, everybody, um, there is one more thing this evening. Cliff Ganyard is speaking. Dr. Cliff Ganyard from the History Department is speaking tonight uh, at the Widener Center in Fort Howard Hall. It is streamed to the Widener Center's YouTube page. You can find that on the Common Cause website. So check that out as well. Um, thank you once again, Renee, and thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.